Good morning. So glad you could be with me today for another of our Unfolding the Word Times together. We're in the midst of a study of the book of Daniel. We're in the second chapter now. I'm going to pick up our reading today in verse 24 of chapter 2. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and he said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and thus said to him, I found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. And the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I've seen in its interpretation? And Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. You remember the context here. God has sent to, to Nebuchadnezzar a troubling dream. In fact, such a troubling dream that he can't sleep until he gets an answer to it. The Magi Order, his think tank of the day, was charged with giving him the interpretation of the dream and letting him know without him telling him the dream what the dream was. And of course, they failed miserably. And in his frustration, he assigned all of them to death. Daniel and his three friends were a part of the Magi order, new members of it, but nonetheless a part of it, and therefore they faced death as well. And we've been looking over the last number of times at how Daniel faced this almost impossible situation, how he took it step by step and learning some of the lessons for our own crisis situations. Now, Daniel is finally at a point where God has given the answer to this dream, and he's ready to come in before the king and share that answer. So in verse 24, we see the beginning of the answer in the encounter with King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I want to begin by reminding you of something that you may not think about when you're first reading through these verses, and that is, Daniel didn't know how the king would respond to the answer God gave. What do I mean by that? Well, as we'll come to see, the interpretation of the dream, the answer from God, was a message that Nebuchadnezzar was not going to be happy about. It was a message that said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're not in charge of history. You can't control what will be happening in the days ahead. Your prideful expectations of your power and the future are not going to be realized because God is the one in charge of history, not Nebuchadnezzar. The interpretation, in other words, was not going to be positive to Nebuchadnezzar. It was undercutting, ultimately, his worldview, his prideful perspective on himself and his prideful perspectives on the future. And in that day and age, before absolute monarchs like Nebuchadnezzar, if you bring a message they don't like, they could kill the messenger. And so Daniel was still, in a very real sense, facing the potential of a disastrous outcome, even in sharing the answer that God had given him, because the answer was not a good one in the sense of being positive and reinforcing for Nebuchadnezzar. And yet, Daniel went forward anyway, trusting God that his purposes would be such that God would be superintending it. He didn't know God would keep him from being killed, but he knew God wanted him to share that message no matter what the cost, no matter what the outcome. And so he did. And as he shares the message, he begins by giving glory to God for the answer. As he put it in verses 27 and 28, no wise men or enchanters or magicians or astrologers could show this mystery, and I can't either, in other words, <laughs> but there's a God in heaven who can show it, and I'm simply his spokesman. It is God who is the source of the answer. 
Daniel, at a very strategic point here, was resisting the temptation <clears throat> to use what God had mercifully provided him, which was this insight into the meaning of the dream. He was withstanding the temptation to use it for personal profit, to pad his own mess, so to speak. He wasn't going to take advantage of that. He was going to give all the glory to God, not to himself, for this answer. I was thinking of 1 Peter 5, 2, where it says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain. Advice to the shepherds of the church, the pastors. He says, don't do this for personal gain. Don't exploit personally the position that I placed you in. Later on in verse 30 of this passage, he says, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom I have more than any other living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your own mind. Verse 30 of Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel says, I'm not going to personally try to benefit from this answer. What a great, great example of trust and confidence in God. And by the way, Ariok was not controlled by any such concerns. <laughs> you notice in verse 25, Ariok says to the king right away, I found among the exiles from Judah a man who can make known to the king the interpretation. In other words, hey, don't forget that I'm the one that found Daniel, and I brought him to you, and I think I should get some personal profit from doing this. <laughs> what a contrast to how Daniel responded to the king when he came before the king with the answer. Verse 28 is the one I want to turn your attention to here. He says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Here's the fact above all facts. The fact that Daniel unashamedly and boldly proclaimed to Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. I was thinking of Francis Schaeffer's book, one of the great scholars and people got it used so much uh, in a previous generation. The classic book he wrote, he is there and he is not silent talking about God, the fact that there's a God there and that he's spoken. <laughs> there's a God in heaven. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, hey, there's a God in heaven. And he is not silent. He reveals the mysteries. The true God our creator, and Nebuchadnezzar, your creator. He is there. The Magi order was powerless because they didn't know that God. It wasn't because they hadn't had good training. They didn't know the one who to know is life itself. They didn't know God. And as a result, they had no answers. The Magi's methods, the Magi's worldview, were a dead end in themselves. Only God, not divination, not sorcery, not worldly wisdom, would be an answer to the dilemma of Nebuchadnezzar and an answer to everybody's dilemma. Now, there is a God in heaven. What a great affirmation. And indirectly, what Daniel's also saying to King Nebuchadnezzar is, you need to deal with the fact that God is really there. You've gotten yourself all prideful thinking you're the master, but there's a God who's really there. And you have to deal with him because he is dealing with you. Nebuchadnezzar, there's a God in heaven. And he's a God before whom you must give an answer. He is a God you must reckon with. Nebuchadnezzar, you, like everybody else, has to answer to this God. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And this God, who is the Lord of history, has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what's going to happen in history. That is what the dream is all about. And we're going to get details about what that latter-day activity is going to involve in these movements of God with kings and time. But nonetheless, he starts off with that premise. There is a God who's really there. And Nebuchadnezzar 
He's the one who gave you this dream. He is the Lord of history. And you are not. And he has given you this dream to give you an insight into the very fact that he, in fact, is the God who is really there. This God who is really there is not silent for Nebuchadnezzar or for you or for me. Isn't it wonderful that he has chosen to breathe out his words so that we can know not human ideas, but God-breathed words, to know from the one who is really there what is true and what is not. Join me tomorrow as we continue in our study together.